Okay, so uh, t uh, today is the birthday of Alessandro Alessandro Anselmi. He's uh, an architect who, in the in the eighties, um, he was uh, well known in Italy and and beyond Italy. Uh, he was part of the group Grau G A R A U, uh, but uh, since postmodernism um, died. He became less uh, less known, but I think some some of his works are worthy of uh, of attention. So <clears throat> today it is his birthday, and I will show uh, a few things by him. I don't think he's an architect uh, who deserves uh, to be uh, unknown or or uh, forgotten. So. Uh, Some drawings. Uh, at that time, in the 80s, uh, his drawings were very much publicized. Uh, it, it was a manner of drawing, of course, manually that was, um, you know, uh, appreciated at that time. And maybe, maybe this kind of drawing should come back to architecture. Maybe at least uh, in order to um, to sustain to cultivate a certain sensuality which perhaps perhaps it's it's more difficult to um, to 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 attain uh, through the digital medium he was of course not the only architect who drew kind of in this way at that time but he was one of those who um, uh, had an impact on architecture, at least to an extent. And when I look at this fragment of this drawing, I see something that uh, even, and I'm not against digital technology at all. I actually advocate the, 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 the thorough knowledge of digital technology. But somehow in the tactility of this drawing, I see some value which it's difficult to, to arrive at through the digital medium, I think. And I like this, 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 it's only a fragment of a larger drawing, but I like it, uh, especially this, you know, you see the architecture, which is, uh, you know, uh, has a certain expressionistic modernity and then the human silhouettes and the shadows and the, the nervousness of the touch here. So I think it's a good drawing. But I actually, in that fragment, I think then, then here as a whole. Anyway, this is a drawing by uh, Alessandro Anselmi. As I said, he worked with, uh, with the group Grau, G-R-A-U, and they built a few things. Um, The truth is, now that I think of it, uh, somehow um, the arrival of the digital technology, um, despite its spectacular uh, results, um, uh, a certain dimension of architecture was perhaps lost or diminished. I mean, who draws like this these days, you know, manually, you know, and, and digitally, you don't quite feel like doing it actually well you do other kinds of drawings but uh, uh, you know to to work with watercolors or pastels of course Stephen Hall works with watercolors but uh, when I think of the drawings of Louis Kahn in pastels you know who, who draws like this today no one no one that I know of anyway 1977, this cemetery, Cimitero Comunale a Parabita, is an interesting work, and I think, uh, I think uh, it, deserves, uh, it deserves to be known. Uh, Aldo Rossi also built a cemetery in Modena in Italy. Carlo Scarpa built one in uh, a little bit earlier uh, at uh, Brion, uh, the Brion Cemetery. Uh, but this one has a... Uh, um, 
the monumentality which is specific to Grau and to Alessandro Anselmi. I don't know if, if they won this uh, through a competition or not. It was built and I actually think it is uh, abandoned. I, I don't know what happened to it, but I saw pictures of it showing uh, some form of uh, destitution, some, some forms of, uh, of, uh, of being abandoned. Um, but even as a ruin, it's not quite a ruin because it's still a you know, rather new work, but, but even as a work which is not used, it's still impressive. And the drawings are interesting too. Of course, all done manually. Now you see some influences here. Louis Kahn, I mentioned Kahn already because of his drawings in pastels. Well, in terms of the physicality of the work, there is a connection with Kahn, yet it's different from Kahn. It's a good work. Why it is not used, I don't know. I mean, in these photographs, it doesn't show that it's not used. I mean, these are photographs that are, you know, uh, probably were done recent, I mean, immediately after the, the work was built. But I have seen other, other images and you'll see them too, where it seems this work is, is either abandoned or, or I don't know, uh, is not kept in any way. Uh, how could you build such a work and not use it? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a mystery to me because it's a big work. It's, it's, it was, you know, uh, some money was spent here and creative energies and so on. There is, I was thinking about the, 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 the fate of the wall. You know, what does the wall mean today? And I remember a conference by Peter Reisemann, which I actually attended many years ago in New York, where he talked about the low media and the high media, the wall being considered the low media and the high media he considered to be, you know, what we usually call by media you know, the internet, the TV, the, you know, the, the newer technologies. But it, it is true, somehow the wall entered into an eclipse. There is some kind of a crisis of the wall somehow. Uh, in, in a way, maybe the digital technology sabotaged, not that this was its intention, but, but conceptually, uh, somehow the, the wall became eroded by virtuality. Well, this, what we see here is the wall before the arrival of the digital technologies and it still has a certain, uh, you know, uh, power and, and gravity that perhaps, perhaps was, was diminished if not totally uh, uh, killed by um, the arrival of um, digitalism or the virtual uh, in architecture. Perhaps it's an adventure, adventurous uh, statement I made. I'm aware of it. Uh, of course, walls are still being uh, produced, but um, I, I wonder if you produce it, produce it digitally, if you believe in that wall, in the, in the, in the physicality, the tectonics, the tactility of that wall, 
as when you drew it manually and when you conceived it at the time when there was no digital uh, technology. Uh, Kenneth Frampton once wrote me saying that the, co the computer killed architecture. I, I, I wouldn't say so. I think there were important buildings that were built after the arrival of the computer and uh, to blame the computer for, uh, you know, certain negative aspects of the architectural uh, realm is, is uh, I don't know, I, I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it, but it's strange in a way and that that someone like him, you know, blames so uh, drastically the computer for killing architecture. Now look at these images. Clearly, this building is not kept. It's it looks like it's abandoned. It's not used. But but I still like them. I still like these images. I mean the the conception of the building is still the here and uh, maybe the drama of architecture is even more perceivable like this than uh, when it was so called new and shining and glittering and all the rest it's a good work i think uh, and uh, who talks about uh, anselmi today uh, I don't, I don't see very often, uh, in fact, I don't see his name mentioned at all. Maybe Domus uh, writes from time to time something about him, and in Italy maybe people still talk about him. Anyway, now another work by them, Lam Grau and uh, Anselmi, Complesso Parochiale San Pio uh, da Pietrelcina in Rome. Um, this one is very different from uh, from the previous one. I I personally prefer the pre the previous work than this one, but this one also cannot be totally ignored. Uh, I, I I don't know if it was in his mind uh, a certain church built by Oscar Niemeyer, which seems to have some connection this building with. Um, anyway, it, it, it's. This is actually, a, a, and this, God, you must forgive me. I'm indeed not very well. This is another work done by Anselmi, and I plan to develop it uh, further. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I, I forgot. But um, so anyway, this is an architecture that is, uh, uh, I would say, more than acceptable. It's, it's, it's good, but it's not totally, you know, it, it, it doesn't really make you say, wow, you have seen such things. I have seen such things. So, so here is the project. And actually this, uh, you, you'll see some images of the, um, during the construction, these, these parts were uh, brought here. They were manufactured metallic structure uh, it was manufactured outside of the site, uh, probably in a factory or something, and brought to the site. You wouldn't really expect it, considering the scale, but this is apparently what happened.
it means not easy to 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 find works by Anselmi uh, on the web today. Uh, I mean, um, I struggled even to get these to get these images. Again, coming back to the viscerality of the of the manual drawing, here we see another example of uh, this is a rough sketch that he did for this building. I kind of miss myself. I, I, I used to, to draw a lot to, with pastel and um, in ink and so on. And I, I, it's true, uh, since I began to work digitally, I, uh, uh, I kind of miss this. this uh, uh, and I don't know if I can go back to it, you know. Um, But I, I look at these drawings and I, I, I like what I see. I, 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 I uh, somehow uh, uh, this drawing makes me want to do architecture. Again, somehow I have the feeling that his drawing uh, looks better in fragments than uh, as a whole. This is the whole page. Okay, uh, I only have these two works by Anselmi uh, today. Uh, now we'll go to Jean Renaudy. Uh, Jean Renaudy, who is, um, was a very interesting uh, French architect and unfortunately he died rather young. And uh, his birthday was actually, and I, 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 I I neglected, I, I didn't know he was born on the 8th, 8th of June. And uh, I, I thought of paying some homage to him a little bit late, but uh, better, better later than never. So Jean Renaudy, born in 1925 and died in 1981. So he was uh, 56 years old when he died. And I, I discovered him accidentally because uh, I, I was looking through an issue of um, uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui and uh, I knew nothing about him, but I discovered the work which you are going to see now. And I said, this is an architect that has to be known by me. So I began to investigate and I, I discovered a few other things by him. I think he was a very interesting architect at Ivry-sur-Seine, and unfortunately I was in France with the students from Bucharest uh, two years ago in, uh, I was there and we searched for Ivry-sur-Seine, we couldn't find it, uh, although it's not far away from Paris. Anyway, it's a very, very interesting work because it is uh, labyrinthical, it is uh, complex, and uh, being covered now by a lot of green, uh, it's also, uh, you know, uh, somehow connected with our uh, preoccupations today. Uh, it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a habitat that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, very different from, of course, in Montreal, uh, Moshe Sabdi, for example, did something in a way, uh, 
in a way similar in a way, but it's more structuralist and more in a way. Here is something else because he uses the triangle and it's, it's this uh, visceralization of architecture through geometry, which is uh, typically his. And uh, I, I think it is remarkable. I mean, compare the buildings behind with what he did here. It's, a, it's an architectural hill, but it's an architectural hill where he uses, uh, he's not mimicking, uh, I mean, he's not, uh, yeah, he's not mimicking, uh, you know, a, a natural hill, but he still uses geometry. But he also uses, uh, and this is important, uh, um, an aleatory dimension, which is, uh, you know, the, the, this, uh, um, this aleatory side of, of his work, I think, is important here. It's, it's less deterministic than, um, let's say, some works even by Bjarke Ingels or uh, there are others who attempt to create mountain-like or hill-like med, ar med architects and so on. He's more, uh, and there is a certain angst almost, a certain tension here. And this was done before the arrival of the computer. He worked you know, manually. So uh, again, you know, we look at these works and we see the works of Jean Renaudie and it's a different kind of urbanism. The dissolution of the mono, um, uh, of the uh, uh, monolithical uh, culture or the monolithical architecture here is uh, uh, remarkable. I keep mentioning in my presentation uh, multiplicity in unity. Here we have the multiplicity of these apartments, houses actually, but they are, they are, they are apartments which look like houses. These units, what are they? Are they apartments? Are they houses? They are both. The apartment became a house. Plus is the arrival or the coming back of the labyrinth. And this is also interesting, you know, the labyrinth. The labyrinth is, uh, was, it was considered a scandal for the intelligence because the labyrinth uh, implies the limits of knowledge in a way and the limits of reason. And so here there is a, uh, the labyrinth is present. It is a labyrinth in architecture. From here, we are not too far away from what is called chaos. But, but if we are to use the word chaos, it is nevertheless a geometrical one. So the, the will of the architect is present. It's an interesting combination between the will of the architect and, uh, you know, uh, chains or uh, uh, aleatory uh, gestures. Not everything is perfect. I mean, uh, there are things, especially at the ground level, that um, are dangerously close to what postmodernism meant, but as a whole, uh, is a distinct uh, kind of architecture, and uh, this belongs to Jean Renaudie and no one else. And these are inexpensive um, houses. I mean, this maybe even social housing. I don't know.
it's, it's interesting the meeting between two systems of disorganization, if I think, if I can call them so, the natural one, the green, and uh, the architectural one, uh, and and they clash. Here is the man with uh, similar schemes behind him, an interesting architect. And uh, I, 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 I wish I, ha I, had, I have a few other things by him here. This is a first attempt to uh, gather material about this interesting French uh, architect, uh, Jean Renaudy. It would, it, it, it would be interesting perhaps to, and maybe it was done, to have a comparison between what the inhabitants of this building feel and what the inhabitants of this building feel and to compare the two uh, perceptions or impressions. Is the difference in terms of quality, the quality of living, the quality of life between living here and living here? A lot of <clears throat> concrete, of course, and uh, <clears throat> concrete is not really contributing to uh, the depth uh, pollution of the world. But uh, what can you do? Uh, at that time, there wasn't so much concern with uh, uh, the negative uh, consequences of using so much concrete. Now, Cité Rato, 1984, uh, still Jean Renaudy, uh, different from what we saw earlier, but even here there are interesting things. Not a lot of sunlight there, it's true. There are rather ominous uh, spaces. But who knows, maybe even if this is the opposite of the Cité Radieuse by Le Corbusier, I, I have a feeling I could be wrong, but I have a feeling that living in these spaces, although they are dark, uh, maybe 
there is a sense of intimacy and belonging to a larger building that maybe in a conventional block of flats you don't have that feeling i don't know i mean the the, the connection between the the exterior space and the interior space is more organic here is more fragmented uh, i don't know again uh, some some kind of a uh, questioning of the people living there about how they feel living such a space in such a space would be interesting. But what I see here, and this also connects in a way with my personal experience since I was born in a, so at least in part medieval town in Transylvania, this, this has a has something of a medieval architecture. Of course, the means are modern, uh, the materials used are modern, the planning is modern, but this visceralization, fragmentation, uh, the irrational side almost of, of this architecture connects somehow with the, with the pre-Renaissance uh, mentality and the pre-Renaissance architecture, I would say. Because it, it seems it is made of fragments that come together in a certain way, not, not, not planned from above, but developing from the bottom up somehow, if I express myself well. I mean, there is still organization here, there is still geometry, but um, because of this fragmentation, you might also imagine that maybe this was built in time, uh, in, in time, uh, you know, unit by unit, and they were clustered together uh, in unexpected ways and so on. So uh, th there seems to be a level of spontaneity which one would connect with a rather pre-Renaissance architecture than post-Renaissance architecture. Okay, this was about Jean Renaudian because two days ago I didn't talk about um, about um, uh, Robert Venturi and Alvaro Siza. I will talk today. So now we'll go to Robert Venturi, uh, an architect who was very famous uh, during his time, but uh, I would say um, something happened to him too. Uh, so Robert Venturi, uh, Robert Venturi, uh, very famous for his writings, complexity and contradiction in, in, in architecture, learning from Las Vegas. I, I, I will be honest with you, when I was preparing this material and I was thinking about his architecture, uh, and not because I had malicious intentions, but somehow I, um, The, these words came to my mind, senile architecture. Now, please forgive me, Mr. Venturi, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to describe your architecture as being senile, but somehow this word came to me and, and, uh, and um, there is something about your architecture which makes me uh, rather want to avoid than, than to, 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 to embrace. So Robert Charles Venturi was an American architect, uh, you see, born uh, June 25th, uh, so two days ago, founding principal of the firm Venturi Scott Brown and associate Scott Brown, Olive Scott Brown being his partner and wife, and one of the major architectural figures of the 20th century. Well, we'll see. Together with his wife and partner, Denise Scott Brown, not Olive, Denise Scott Brown, he helped shape the way that architects, planners, and students experience and think about architecture and the built environment. The buildings, planning, theoretical writings, and teaching have also contributed to the expansion of discourse about architecture. I didn't write this text. Venturi was awarded the Prisker Prize in Architecture in 1991. The prize was awarded to him alone, despite a request to include his equal partner, Scott Brown. 
Subsequently, a group of women architects attempted to get her name added retroactively to the prize, but the Pritzker Prize jury declined to do so. Venturi is also known for having coined the maxim, less is a bore, a postmodern, uh, post postmodern added antidote to Miss van der Rohe's famous modernist dictum, less is more. Venturi lived in Philadelphia with Dennis Scott Brown. He is the father of James Venturi, founder and principal of Rethink uh, uh, Studio. Uh, you know, he played with the words of Miss van der Rohe and I, I play, I felt tempted to play with his words. So instead of less is a bore, I would say less is a bore, less referring to Las Vegas. Anyway, uh, I once wrote a little poem, uh, if I am to call it a poem, uh, reflecting on the relationship between less and more. So I, I said that I, like this, many times less is less, a few times less is more, many times more is less, a few times more is more. What I meant is that, you know, minimalism at its best, uh, in, 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 in the case of minimalism, when is at its best, less is indeed more and is not a bore. Equally, uh, uh, in the case of, let's say, the Baroque, uh, the best Baroque architecture, the best uh, Rococo architecture, in that case, more is more, but so very often, more is actually less. So it depends on the quality of the work. There are works where even if you condense in minimalism a lot, you still achieve that more. So in that case, indeed, less is more. Equally, there are works where uh, through excess, you achieve that more, that qualitative more. So I think he was a little bit simplistic saying less is a bore. From what po one point of view, he's correct. But from another point of view, he is not. And I personally wouldn't take Las Vegas as a great example to follow. I don't know if I can learn anything from Las Vegas. This was the man. I read somewhere, I don't know if my memory is good, but this, this, this is what my memory tells me that uh, apparently I mean, he was the assistant of Louis Kahn. Uh, I don't know if for a longer time or a short time at one point in Philadelphia. And uh, apparently Louis Kahn um, uh, seduced the girlfriend of Robert Venturi. Uh, of course, there was a difference in age, but uh, <laughs> Robert Venturi came to uh, introduce his girlfriend to Louis Kahn and apparently Louis Kahn uh, with his uh, more um, charming perhaps or uh, you know uh, exotic even uh, personality seduced the, the girlfriend of his assistant that is Robert Venturi but Let's hope my my memory is uh, is uh, not uh, doing some uh, malevolent um, work on me, but but uh, listen, you know, I mean, if this is more, if this is the antidote of less is more, then you know I would rather have less. Uh, you know, I, I mean the the so-called more of this <clears throat> so-called architecture. <clears throat> turns me off. To me, this is very boring. Uh, and it, it's, it's more so-called less than the most, uh, uh, most of the minimalist works. Here he is as a, as a younger man. And interesting, he was, uh, he was uh, at, at one point when he was young, he was uh, um, raised as a, as a Quaker. This is very interesting. I just learned preparing this material. Uh, and it would be interesting in a way to compare the architecture of the Quaker movement, uh, the Quakers, 
to to Venturi's uh, architecture. Okay, then is Scott Brown and Robert Venturi the the famous couple? Here they are. But uh, I, I don't know. I I don't know. I I, I mean, I, I I look at them. I mean, they, they they were they they were working for high academia, you know, teaching at Princeton and uh, you know uh, at Yale and so on. You know, they were professors also. Uh, but uh, there is something in them which um, turns me off <laughs> in both of them i confess now this famous house from 1964 was even let me read vana venturi this was done for his mother venturi's mother 1964 won the aia 25-year award and was recognized as a masterwork of modern american architecture by the United States Postal Service in May 2005. Now, you know, is it truly the, the role of the, the United States Postal Service to recognize, um, you know, a masterwork in architecture? Perhaps not. But you know this building, it was, um, you know, published uh, extensively. I don't know, I mean, it's, it, it, it passes the test of time, I would say, but, um, its gentleness, so to speak, uh, uh, is, um, I mean, you know, I, I look at these things here, you know, and yes, there are suggestions of, you know, some kind of flirtation with the past, with history, you know, uh, learning from the past, he even, um, you know, um, mentions in his writing Michelangelo and so on, but um, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't think his architecture is heroic, <clears throat> and uh, I understand. <clears throat> I understand why that could be seen as a quality, sometimes. But uh, I, I, I don't know. The architecture is some kind of melange, a mixture between domesticity. I mean, it's a house, of course. But he did other buildings that are not domestic, I mean, in terms of their function. And um, this is one of his best buildings, if not the best. And it has qualities, but um, I don't know. I mean, you know, the facade, it's, it's clearly a facade. And what's behind it is a little bit different. So the building, I understand it's about representation. You have a facade, you know, a historical facade is not historicist. And behind the building is not necessary. I mean, the facade could have been different. Look, seen from here, you wouldn't expect that facade. That is probably his mother or no, it's someone who helped anyway. Uh, I can see very well. Uh, it's him, it's Venturi, clearly. Uh, I personally think postmodernism has a di had a disastrous effect on architecture. And uh, I'm glad it ended. Although there are people who um, somehow uh, try to rejuvenate postmodernism. It's an eclectic building and it has quality as a such. It has a certain level of complexity, it's true.
<laughs> it just crossed my mind. I'm not sure if Venturi's mother truly enjoyed this uh, torturous, torturous um, stare here, you know. But uh, <laughs> mothers usually forget everything, uh, you know, forgive everything their sons do. What about the height of these threads here, you know, while they, you know, they what I see here seems to contradict, uh, you know, uh, Neufert. The Guildhouse, also a well-known project by him, also from 1964. Uh, sorry, uh, what's going on here? Ah, I made a note for myself. It will be later after I show more images of this house built for his mother, sorry. So what this building is telling us is that the facade, the main facade, as a representational quality, it is more elaborate. In a way, you know, the way the building is when it's, it doesn't need to, to show a certain uh, face in the age of Facebook, face to a society is uh, without any glory, eh? without any representational glory. But this is you know, the fascia, the face of the building, uh, you know, uh, making the transition from the private to the public. I understand this, but uh, in a way it's too didactic, I think, and too, uh, too rhetorical. Now the Guildhouse, Philadelphia, 1964, it's a, an apartment building Literally, in his architecture, what counts, counts the most is the main elevation. And if he wouldn't write here guild house, it would be a very banal building. I mean, you know, well, yes, you have this uh, thing here at the top, maybe some kind of uh, indirect uh, homage to the man who stole his girlfriend. Um, so he wrote with big letters, Guild House. Okay, okay. But if you remove this, and you remove this, you get a, really a very banal. There are three interesting things here, so to speak, is the naming of the building, is this thing here. And then this line, which is of a, of a, of a, of a ornamental nature. And I don't know exactly why it is here and not here. But let it be there. But otherwise, the you know the building is, I would say, banal. So you know, this was called you know fifty years of everyday extraordinary design. But this wording is kind of. Uh, interesting can you have extraordinary things in the everyday and i think the everyday is extraordinary if we have the eyes to to see it it's true so i i like this double e maybe we should make a, a you know a gathering and talk about the double e everyday extraordinary or extraordinary everyday there is poetry in the everyday i agree but, uh, you know, look, I, I discovered this image on the web, Philadelphia, the, the Guild House, most influential work of 20th century architecture. Come on, really, you know, it, it, is a, it is a known work, it's true, but to call it the most influential work 
of 20th century architecture is really to push to push uh, everything to push the limits but this is also a housing project a social housing project and i like the fact that he worked for um, for the, the underprivileged Now I see here letter E, I wonder, does it stand for uh, everyday exceptional? No, it stands for exit. Well, from the back is uh, only every day, but not uh, exceptional. And even that uh, not, uh, every day is not truly what I mean by every day. The every day contains its own poetry and that poetry has to be discovered. But I'm not sure in the back of the building Venturi was preoccupied with a, with a genuine poetry of the, of the every day. Here is the architect. Yes, in a way, he is human, you know, very human, maybe all too human. I don't know. Fire station, Columbus, 1968. But monumentalizing the everyday is, is, is I think, uh, problematic. And monumentalizing the, 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 the impact or the, the importance of Robert Venturi and uh, Dennis Scott Brown, I think, is also problematic. They have their quality and their role, I would agree. But I would say rather in the, in the, in the, in, in the North American context. I wouldn't export this kind of architecture everywhere in the world. Now it was meant for uh, for the United States, but behind the rather German cars, the Volkswagens. Here we see the work of Michelangelo on the left and uh, you know, the, the fire station by Venturi on the right. Somebody thought of bringing these two together for Tapia and the fire station by Robert Venturi. A Memorial Art Museum, 1976, well, close to a, a historical building that was not built by him, by them. So he, he did only the, what is on the right side and not what is here. I don't know, I mean,
So this was not this was by uh, Gibbert. Uh, this building is not by him, although in the presentation I discovered on the web it shows that this building is by him. Now what he did he did just the the addition on the right side. Here they are: uh, Dennis Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel tempted to be malicious, although I am not uh, health-wise uh, at my best, but uh, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. I, it's something about their romance uh, that uh, and, and their architecture that turns me off. Franklin Court, United States, 1976. They had uh, some interesting ideas, it's true, but it, it is too, you know, didactic and too you know, connected with, uh, in a didactic way with history and something is missing. I think the, the vital impulse of nature, of uh, that energy, uh, something is missing in this, in this architecture. <clears throat> I used to know when I lived in New York, uh, a young man who was uh, the right hand, uh, Fred Schwartz, uh, Frederick Schwartz, uh, he was also teaching at the Institute for Architecture and Urbanism uh, that uh, Peter Eisenman founded. And anyway, uh, in the 80s, um, Venturi still meant something. Seattle Art Museum, 1991. Now look, when I see this sort of thing, <clears throat> uh, he said, less is a bore. And uh, I understand to an extent what he said, but <clears throat> if this is more, I would protest. I don't think this is more. So I don't think this is the way to avoid boredom, in my opinion. And again, I think to find uh, inspiration in Las Vegas is problematic. The artwork, though, is interesting, but this is not by them. I think the building would have been better without this uh, bonanza here, you know. Really, this is almost, sorry for the strong word, disgusting, you know, I mean, and I'm not a purist. But look, what's going on here? You know, this is small, a small version of this, and it's it's applied to the building. I don't like it. You know, it's 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 packaging. It's vulgar packaging. This is McDonald architecture. It's terrible. Really, I, I, I would feel ashamed to do something like this. And this is just, you know, in order to connect to the public, so to speak, the building would have been much better without this uh, decor, without this uh, stage design here, which is so cheap and, and vulgar and uh, commercial and anyway. But yes, I like the artwork, it's true. <laughs> I don't know what its symbolism, but uh, I mean, what I see here is the, the really the. Uh, I, I feel very tempted to to be very critical. I I like ornament in architecture, but not in this way. This is uh, an inspired decorative work. It's not an ornament that grows from the building, like uh, in the case of Louis Sullivan. It's, it's applied to the building and it even it doesn't want to co co conceal this it is frankly telling you that is a work which is not frank that is is not sincere maybe i'm too harsh i don't know
Uh, you see clearly the Las Vegas uh, fatidic uh, influence, malevolent influence. It's terrible. One has to write a book on learning from Las Vegas. If that book was not already written. Episcopal Academy Chapel. Uh, he did something like this too. It has interesting parts, I would agree, but um, I don't know. Uh, it's not one of my favorite architects, it's true. He is less senile here maybe than in other works, but still it's something uh, inauthentic somehow. Unless, unless you say that inauthenticity is part of the out, is part of the truth of life, that that could be uh, assumed such a such a thought. But uh, in here again, you know, we see this uh, fascia, this uh, representational thing that is. It's all, almost as if the architect says, okay, I am doing the building as I want to do it, but then towards you, I dress for the public meeting, for the collectiveness, for the, for the yes, for the public uh, realm, I, I dress for the occasion in a different way. So I put up a mask. I, uh, here they are, the architects. I mean, even in terms of uh, dressing, I think this uh, this thing on, on, on his chest is rather ridiculous. I'm sorry, Mr. Venturi, you are of an Italian origin. I imagine the Italians know how to dress, but uh, I don't think you care too much. On the other hand, I like certain things about the man and even about the way he dresses, the fact that the, this arm seems to be shorter than it's supposed to be. And of course, at his... Uh, prestige and his money he could have he could have found a coat with a, you know the correct length of his uh, of the arm anyway I, I know I shouldn't talk about the, these issues but uh, the building has some interesting things going on here you know there is a certain uh, turmoil so to speak but uh, The synagogue. Now, you know, if, if he would have called this a fire station, I would have believed him in as much as uh, if it says uh, 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 congregation Beth El synagogue. You know, <laughs> I, I, I just don't believe him. I mean, is this a synagogue? Uh, and if it is, why? Because it is written here on the, it's a congregation uh, building, uh, I, I don't know. Like he doesn't convince me. That's it. I'm not going to show today uh, Alvaro Siza because Alvaro Siza is a more complex uh, architect and with a very rich work. And I am truly yet not at my best, but at least we looked uh, even if uh, not you know, uh, 